Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Angela Mackey and you're watching Ask the Mayo Mom on Mayo Clinic's Facebook Live. I'm a pediatrician at Mayo Clinic Children's Center and twice per month, I host a show about pediatric health topics where we take and answer your questions live. Today, we will be discussing congenital heart disease. Congenital heart defects are the most common birth defects in the United States, affecting approximately one in every 110 babies each year. It's estimated that approximately 25% of children born with congenital heart disease will need heart surgery or other interventions to survive. For some types of congenital heart disease, surgery is not a cure, but we will be discussing more about this today. Joining us for this discussion are two well-respected pediatric cardiovascular surgeons. Our first guest is Dr. Joseph Duraney, the Chair of Cardiovascular Surgery at Mayo Clinic Children's Center and Mayo Clinic. Our second guest is Dr. David Overman, the Chief of Cardiovascular Surgery at Children's Minnesota. We will be discussing our new collaboration between our institutions to share talent and resources across Rochester and Minneapolis campuses. This will form one of the largest and most diverse cardiovascular surgery collaborations in the United States, and it will advance care, create knowledge, and educate future leaders. It's going to be a great discussion today, so please send your questions under the Facebook Live video feed, and we will try our best to review them during the live broadcast today. So Dr. Duraney and Dr. Overman, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. And Dr. Overman for making the trip down to Rochester yeah, today. Yeah, sure. So I mentioned a collaboration that um, has um, been um, coming developed recently through our, our institutions, and it's going to be to kind of share and collaborate in regards to cardiovascular surgery um, and other areas. Can you tell us a little bit more about how this can benefit patients? Sure, Dave. Well, um, Joe and I have been colleagues for for a couple of decades yeah. now, and um, we have uh, shared patients, and we've uh, kind of leaned on each other from time to time for various challenging uh, clinical scenarios and such. Our uh, teams know each other well, and we talked many times over the years about a more formal collaboration between our two centers. Mm -hmm. um, both strong organizations with lots of talented people, mm -hmm. but um, being able to bring those together and work as a single team to serve the region and the central United States and beyond is a really, really great opportunity, and um, so we're real excited about that. Yeah, I mean, we've, as David had said, we've we've been worked together for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Our colleagues have worked together for 20 years. Mm -hmm. We've we've shared patients. We've attended conferences we've participated in professional societies at the administrative level for a long time and you know congenital heart disease is sort of the it's the ultimate sort of discipline that requires sort of an alignment of many types of practitioners mm -hmm. so it's sort of the epitome of of multidisciplinary care and when you look at the the skill sets and the talent and the expertise of people that are anchored in Minneapolis and you look at you know, um, the similar set of people in Rochester. And, you know, for years, David and I have been talking about, God, it would be so great. I mean, you have this person down there and we have this person up there if we could sort of join forces mm -hmm. in some meaningful way. And that's really how it all, all came to be. We finally have been able to sort of get to a point where we can make it happen. And I think part of the, the push has been this national um, impetus for the, quote, regionalization of care. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense for 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 a lot of things in healthcare um, to try to you know reduce the cumulative number of programs um, so that you have fewer doing higher quality work. Um, yeah. And we just felt that this was just sort of the natural transition. Mm -hmm. There's of, no question. I think that uh, from a broader public health point of view, regionalization of care and centralization of these very rare and challenging um, diseases is, is a trend, uh, both on the payer side and on uh, professional society side. And so um, we're hoping to really lead the way um, by proactively doing that mm -hmm. and, and forming a, a, a really deep and uh, capable center in the upper Midwest here. That's fantastic. So it's going to benefit patients, but there's also going to be innovations that are going to be resulting out of this. Can you talk a little bit about some of those? Sure. Well, I think the first, you know, the 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 first 50 years of cardiac surgery mm -hmm. was marked by innovations all over the place, Absolutely. and uh, most of the innovations were the were sort of the the introduction of new procedures. Mm -hmm. uh, ironically, many of which 
actually started in the Midwest between the University of Minnesota and Mayo Clinic back from the 1950s. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the Midwest and, and uh, has always sort of had a presence. I think the next you know, 50 years of cardiac surgery is going to include the introduction of, introduction of a lot of these new technologies. Mm -hmm. Um, technologies where things are done in the cath lab instead of the operating room or as a complementary, you know, um, strategy to what is already done in the operating room. I think, um, you know, clinical trials and a lot of the clinical trials are done from a multi-institutional standpoint. Mm -hmm. So having, you know, one program that has, you know, common protocols and algorithms and a sort of a systematic approach to how you deal with various lesions, it, you know, this will be a strength that we have together in terms of positioning us well to either lead some of these trials or be a major, major player in one of these trials. And yeah, I think finally... I would say, for instance, mm -hmm. so yeah. specifically, um, uh, cellular and genomic therapies okay. really uh, probably have the largest promise uh, mm -hmm. going forward so that would be a broad area of innovation that uh, is an important mm -hmm. uh, thing to be involved with um, and invest in and um, I also think that um, there's some a promise for in utero interventions that now are really still sort of an exploratory or experimental phase mm -hmm. and their applicability is rather limited but but that will probably change over time mm -hmm. so those would be two specific things right. innovation wise that i think would impact the field of congenital heart yeah. surgery a lot and the the fetal the fetal heart mm -hmm. interventions which is obviously it's a very common question with with yeah, parents because right. now the you know the prenatal ultrasounds identify these mm -hmm. issues and not only that right. but some of the genetic blood tests which will be done even earlier right. you know uh, mothers and and parents in general will mm -hmm. will know about this very early on and so the importance of if anything can be done early to at least reduce the 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 severity of the lesion mm -hmm. before birth would be helpful and that actually when when David and I look at our respective programs, we have a lot of horsepower on each end with yeah. that. And mm -hmm. with the advances in technology, I mean, we really are positioned very, very well to explore some of those things, which in cardiac has been relatively limited to this point. But mm -hmm. I think, you know, 10 or 20 years from now, mm -hmm. I mean, that could be a real stake in the ground. That could be, you know, the next greatest thing since, you know, the onset of neonatal heart surgery back in the 1980s. So... It's exciting. It is exciting. Sure. And one area is, is the WANIC um, program for HLHS. Can you talk a little bit about that and how um, yeah. what, what's going to be going forward with that as well, regards to innovations? Yeah, sure. Um, so Todd and Karen WANIC had uh, a, a girl uh, who had hypoplastic left heart syndrome, was treated uh, very ably here at the Mayo Clinic, and she's grown into uh, you know a, a teenager now. I believe she's. I think she's even fourteen or fifteen years old. Now. She could, I think she's older than that. I think she exactly. could be close to twenty. I mean, I think she's. And getting... so um, they, of course, through that experience, developed a real burden and passion for solving uh, the problem of mm -hmm. hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and specifically using stem cell therapies for these children and um, the uh, a cardiologist who actually is an adult cardiologist by training but became interested in single ventricle congenital heart disease and hypoplastic left heart syndrome specifically Dr. Tim Nelson mm -hmm. is a Mayo Clinic cardiologist and a bench researcher has National Institutes of Health uh, grant to uh, explore the use of umbilical cord blood derived stem cells to rehabilitate failing single ventricles in the context of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So that is that he and and that exploration the 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 uh, Todd and Karen Wanick HLHS consortium uh, which involves both of our institutions and then five or six other very uh, prominent institutions around the country, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, uh, Children's Hospital of Colorado, etc. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's one of a couple of consortiums mm -hmm. that is uh, uh, looking at this clinical question and therapy um, around the country. And 
um, it's you know a great example both of the utilization potentially of stem cell therapies in congenital heart disease or other genomic uh, mm -hmm. therapies. It's also a great example of the power of our collaboration regionally because of you know that is that that is a very deep and uh, resource intensive laboratory. Um, the Children's of Minnesota can't really carry the water that way, the way the Mayo Clinic can. Conversely, in, in the midst of a metropolitan area, the mm -hmm. density and uh, numbers of babies with hypoplastic left heart syndrome is a lot more than it is in Olmstead County. So mm -hmm. to bring together those two institutional profiles really, <clears throat> you know, logarithmically improves uh, therapies for the uh -huh. baby and the mission of the two institutions. Absolutely. Well, kind of backing up a little bit, mm -hmm. um, for, sure. let's just start for people that maybe don't have a background or have a child with congenital heart disease. What is congenital heart disease just in general and, and how, how common are we seeing these defects um, occur? So as you as you acknowledged in the early in the early part of the introduction, it is the most common birth mm -hmm. defect. It's about one in one hundred one to one hundred and twenty, but it's basically one okay. percent. And um, most all of them are a structural heart defect. Mm -hmm. It means there's something wrong with a the valve. There's a hole in the heart. Blood vessels either going to the heart or leaving the heart or crisscrossed, or there's mm -hmm. some some structural defect mm -hmm. that requires um, a procedure to fix it. And most of those procedures are done surgically. Mm -hmm. Um, there are some um, less severe defects that can be fixed in the cardiac catheterization lab. Mm -hmm. For example, atrial septal defect, which is probably one of the most common ones. Mm -hmm. Many of those can be closed without an operation. But when that defect occurs in combination with other problems, and it's not mm -hmm. uncommon for there to be multiple things that are abnormal, surgery still is more or less the mainstay of treatment. But the good news is, is that many of them can be fixed mm -hmm. or corrected. Uh, many of the operations are done in the first month or the first year of life. Um, the general practice is earlier, mm -hmm. is better, it allows more normal growth and development and so on. Um, and many of the children can grow up and go to school and many can participate in sports and many can become you know, very productive members of society. There are some lesions which don't have such an optimistic view, but nevertheless, we still have made leaps and bounds improvements compared to what we were doing 20 and 30 years ago with those lesions. So um, while it can be frustrating for some, mm -hmm. it certainly has gotten better in more <clears throat> recent times compared to what it had been. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I think, at least I'm sure David would agree, I mean, it's a very, it's a very gratifying specialty for us as surgeons, and I know it is for cardiologists, because I think we really feel like the impact is so, it's so great, mm -hmm. because you make a difference in, you know, where you start and where, where that child or where that patient ends up, that it's, it's a very, it's a very addictive specialty when you have that kind of feedback often, mm -hmm. and of course, we have all had our disappointments along the way, and that's always sort of the reality check, but in balance, you know, mm -hmm. the wins far outweigh the losses, and you know, it's a specialty that I still would do all over again exactly the same way if I was going to do it today. 100%. Yeah. So you mentioned because of the new technology we have with fetal echoes and being able to diagnose these congenital heart disease lesions early on, um, that parents are finding out earlier. And so for a parent out there who's watching, what advice would you give to them as they um, are just kind of coming to terms with this diagnosis? Sure. And, and um, what would be important for them to know going forward? Yeah, I think um, you're right that the prenatal diagnosis is more and more frequent mm -hmm. and expertise in fetal cardiology um, and fetal intervention for that matter is uh, of increasing importance mm -hmm. in, in particularly. So if you have a baby who's been diagnosed with critical congenital heart disease prenatally, mm -hmm. what I would say to uh, that family is, uh, well, number one, uh, do your homework and figure out where where is this being done mm -hmm. in, in my region mm -hmm. and what are the profiles of those institutions. The important things to look at are the, the breadth of the professional staff and what is the structure of the program. Um, are, is this a staff of three and uh, you know a general ICU or is it 
a staff of 20 or more cardiovascular specialists, a cardiac ICU, um, diagnostic uh, regimens that, you know, cover all bases, this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> then I would also um, look at what the surgical volume of the institution is. That's a very important thing. Volume and outcomes do have uh, a statistical correlation and important relationship. So that would be another important thing for moms and dads to, to look at. Um, and then um, as Joe alluded to earlier, does your institution publicly report its outcomes? Is there transparency about mm -hmm. their outcomes? And don't be shy about asking questions. Um, don't be shy about asking for a second opinion. Mm -hmm. um, even if it's just to ratify what you're hearing from, from your caregivers. Mm -hmm. um, what I always say to families is you've got to feel like your gut is telling you it's okay here. Mm -hmm. And the reason is not because you're going to be able to necessarily pick the perfect team, but it's because if, heaven forbid, something were to go awry or outcome was suboptimal or things got tough along the way, it's pretty hard to live with the nagging feeling like you didn't explore this Mm -hmm. when you when you felt like you should have. So you want to feel like you're in the right place and you've done everything you can to figure that out. Um, at the end of the day, you should be prepared for a lot of ups and downs, a, a winding path, mm -hmm. and it is a relationship of trust. Mm -hmm. You can't, you're not going to be able to control what happens, unfortunately. And mm -hmm. so you really do need to feel <clears throat> like in your gut you're in the right spot. I think I agree completely. I mean, yeah. David has summarized it quite well, and I don't have a lot to add except I think the other, you know, the other side of it is I think which 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 comes up, you know, for for the mother and <coughs> of course the parents in general mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. what what am I really getting into? I mean, mm -hmm. just beyond where it's going to be. I mean, what is the general future? Is this, exactly. Do I do I keep this? baby yeah do is you know the the subject of termination you know comes up in their own mind and I mean I think you know for David and I and for the practitioners I mean we we, we I think we clearly indicate that we are here to help mm -hmm. you know we are not here to judge and I mm -hmm. think that whatever personal decisions they may decide to do it would be a personal choice but in the event that they want to proceed down a path and follow through even in the circumstances when the outlook may not be as promising or, or, or optimistic as we would like, mm -hmm. there are people, you know, that are going to be around that can help. And I think to David's point about, you know, how complicated it is, you know, does make sense then to make sure that you mm -hmm. feel like you're in the right environment to give, you know, to give the baby and everybody the best possible chance. But these are the questions that come up. And then you know, there's there's good lesions, mm -hmm. good meaning, you know, when it's fixed, the, the overall quality of life is going to be very, very good. You know, mm -hmm. the question is, is it going to be normal? I usually, normal is a pretty strong word when you're talking about it's a congenital effective. heart defect, mm -hmm. yeah. but I usually say mm -hmm. good yeah. and near normal, <coughs> mm -hmm. you know, for that. And then there's some where it's not. It's challenging, as David said, and I mean, the, you know, the emotional wear and tear that mm -hmm. it takes on a, on, on a family, not, not just the mother yes. or the parents, yeah. but mm -hmm. the family. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes there's other there's siblings and there's school and the, you know parents are separated from other children because they're here they're in the hospital if they travel then there's the whole distance thing in the in the and so they need to be really kept well appraised you know mm -hmm. of that so that they know what the the big picture looks mm -hmm. like but um, I would I would add to that mm -hmm. that um, in the midst of those challenges early on, it mm -hmm. can feel like this is never going to end. Yeah. But what I, I often remind uh, parents is that when when I see you 10 or 15 years from now, mm -hmm. I won't, I'll be retired by then now, but the, <laughs> but the, but, but hopefully the, the <laughs> point, the point being that when you have your, when you're taking your kid to mm -hmm. their eighth grade graduation, this is going to all be a distant memory you'll right. never forget it right. uh, but this is only a short period of time and mm -hmm. it is very challenging it is very disruptive but just as Joe alluded to uh, in terms of the rewards the mm -hmm. payback yeah 
um, there's nothing like seeing a kid 15 years down mm -hmm. the road uh, who you you thought maybe this kid isn't going to make it mm -hmm. and and they did and those parents hung tough and it's a it's the yeah. most rewarding mm -hmm. thing you can possibly imagine and as you know from right. the media mm -hmm. there are many there are many mm -hmm. adults out there that right. have, were born with a congenital heart defect that not only have they done standard things they've mm -hmm. done amazing things right. when you look, look at olympians yes. and everything else i mean there are a yeah. lot of wonderful right. success stories out there and mm -hmm. actually that's what many of the parents need to latch on that's why we do that, that's do. that's why we do what we do <laughs> i mean yeah. that's let's talk a little bit about uh, you know you're talking about as they're growing older but th their health care needs are still need to be addressed especially the congenital heart disease right. um, needs and how those are going to continue to adulthood can you talk a little bit about how the u.s has been kind of working more on adult congenital heart disease management and what these people will need in adulthood for sure well mm -hmm. you know the mayo clinic is probably ground zero for mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. pioneering the field of adult congenital mm -hmm. heart disease and the depth of expertise here is un unmatched. Mm -hmm. So I'll defer to, <laughs> okay. I'll defer to <laughs> that, that Dr. Durain for that. Well, I would say, I think one of the, one of the things that you sort of mm -hmm. alluded to, I, I will say that as a country, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. we've lagged a little bit behind in terms of an organized transfer of care from pediatrics mm -hmm. to adulthood. Um, you know, Europe and, and Canada have been much more organized in terms of what the handoff is like, mm -hmm. you know, between the between the pediatrician mm -hmm. and who is going to follow them and the on the adult side. We now, just in the last handful of years, we now have recognized acknowledgement of adult congenital heart disease as a specialty in both on the medicine side and uh, you know on the surgery side as well. And I think the the I would say that. While we fix many lesions and we consider it to be a done deal and there's really very little to do down mm -hmm. the road, that is the case for many lesions, but there still is something to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't want to lose contact <clears throat> with just general your overall general health care. I mean, basic mm -hmm. fi histories and physicals. I right. mean, arrhythmias are something that can pop up down mm -hmm. the road, and it shouldn't completely fall off the radar screen, but right. there are lesions where... The, over, the intensity of oversight is relatively minimal, mm -hmm. but not zero. And there are others where the oversight is actually quite demanding, and right. it really requires the expertise of an adult congenital cardiologist and you know, what, are the, what are the periodic imaging studies that need to be mm -hmm. done, and, and so on and so forth. And I think that you know, we are um, now really making a lot of headway you know, in mm -hmm. this area. It's actually one of the hot areas for young trainees that are trying to find a role mm -hmm. and, and, and an area where mm -hmm. they feel like they're going to have a good job, they're going to have patients to take care of, they're going to have a practice that's evolving. Mm -hmm. You know, management of adults with congenital heart disease, it is in its prime time right now. And it's, uh, you know, for those that are interested, yeah. it's a great, great opportunity. There's a, you know, well, mm -hmm. um, widely distributed demographic uh, information that if you look at the number of children with congenital heart disease and mm -hmm. the number of adults with congenital right. heart disease, the adults now outnumber the children. Which it didn't and used to be like that, right? right. Yeah. It just gives you an idea. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah. it's mm -hmm. in part because of the success of the mm -hmm. field overall mm -hmm. and their people are surviving into adulthood, mm -hmm. but those survivors had operations in the 80s or the 90s mm -hmm. or the early 2000s that now techniques have changed a fair amount. and. Mm -hmm. um, even now, solutions are relatively imperfect for many things. Mm -hmm. um, they're good, but they're not perfect. Right. And so what, what I always make sure parents are f uh, clear on, and uh, cardiologists, I'm sure, the same, this is a lifelong endeavor. You, mm -hmm. you, you're, you had a baby who has mm -hmm. congenital heart disease. That baby is going to have a relationship with a cardiologist the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that's, oh, it's June, it's time to see Dr. So-and-so, everything looks good, see you in a year. But mm -hmm. it's never, I'm done. Right. Right. And um, that that's, at, that's even key. the simplest mm -hmm. lesions, say repair of coarctation, those patients are known to have 
increased incidence of hypertension in mm -hmm. adulthood, increased incidence of cardi coronary artery disease, mm -hmm. accelerated coronary artery. So there are important issues later in adulthood that definitely, as Joe says, mm -hmm. needs to be monitored. You may or may not need anything done, but you're you're never you never get a get out of jail card. You know, you're you're yeah. going to be seeing somebody your whole life. So we're nearing the end of our time, but as you're kind of talking about some of these more single ventral pathology lesions that are going to require multiple surgeries, yeah. sometimes in the back of a lot of parents' mind is, is there going to be a need for transplant at some point? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so the role of transplantation has grown mm -hmm. um, uh, over time. It's, its role and the numbers of transplantation in our context, that is congenital heart disease, mm -hmm. um, has been limited by donor availability, so that that's a practical matter in terms of application of the therapy for mm -hmm. for everybody. Um, but um, its role for you mentioned single ventricle heart disease mm -hmm. patients like the hypoplastic left heart syndrome we mentioned earlier. Um, I would say, and 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 uh, Joe. Um, can give you his opinion on it too, but in general, I would say transplantation is kind of a destination for a patient who has one ventricle, mm -hmm. um, and they're challenging uh, mm -hmm. transplants to be sure. But that more or less should be something that I'm thinking in my 30s, in my 40s, I may be okay. on a transplant list. Its role in other uh, anatomies is is more infrequent and mm -hmm. certainly the vast majority of patients who have congenital heart disease will never that will never be part of the conversation mm -hmm. but it's certainly a critical therapy in some more complex patients mm -hmm. yeah I would say that for David and me and every pediatric cardiologist and every pediatric cardiac surgeon mm -hmm. we're trying to keep the transplant word out of every conversation mm -hmm. that we have I mean mm -hmm. It's a great solution when it's absolutely necessary. Okay. But back mm -hmm. to what we talked about in the mm -hmm. beginning with mm -hmm. you know stem cell therapy yes. and all of these innovations <coughs> that we are too, yeah. we're mm -hmm. doing right. are in an effort to either delay yes. transplant or avoid it altogether. Right. And it's only going to get better as time goes by. But they're, the single ventricle patients, as a group mm -hmm. in congenital heart disease, they're the ones that are most likely to go in that direction. But okay. Again, we're trying to, to avoid it. we're trying to avoid it, but, mm -hmm. but because it, um, as we've seen, you know, twenty years, fifteen, mm -hmm. twenty years is forever in this field. Mm -hmm. How you look back at how dramatically things have changed, right. and so you don't know. You're you're right. you're giving the best solution you can in mm -hmm. the near term, mm -hmm. so that that child has a high quality of life, and. Who knows? You know, you might be mm -hmm. growing things and pulling them off of a shelf for that's 15 right. years. So you, you just don't right, know. Right. That's right. Yeah. The genetic engineering thing is that's going to be another door of possibilities. Right. That's exciting, and I, I look forward to hearing what the innovations are like in you know 15 years since you're not yeah. going to retire yet, and we can talk about it then. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, even if I am, I'll come back and okay. talk. Sounds about it. good. Yeah. We've got about one minute left, so real briefly, can you talk a little bit about your collaborations with humanitarian efforts and the lessons that you've learned in these in these um, these efforts together? Because I understand you guys have yeah, worked you go together. Ahead. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, when I finished my training in California, <laughs> my mentor out there, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Bailey, who actually was the one that pioneered neonatal heart transplant, who recently passed away, sadly. Um, he told me when I finished my training that um, make sure you incorporate humanitarian outreach into your professional life. It will be the most gratifying part of your career. And so I took that to heart, and as it turns out, the largest non-government organization with the longest history of providing humanitarian outreach activities happens to be in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I got a line. Start, started at Children's of Minnesota. Ms. Joe that, Kaiser is, well, that's, that, that's right. So it's another example that's of another, this yeah. how it all come, relationship. How it all comes back together. All the lives and all that stuff. Right. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so we, and then soon thereafter, you know, David, mm -hmm. you know, jumped on board. And I think, I think there's a lot of pediatric heart surgeons that have incorporated this mm -hmm. into their career. It's a yeah. very, it's a natural specialty mostly because of what we talked about. I mean, mm -hmm. you can do these operations and you can, quote, fix children that right. then can go on and have a meaningful, you know, a meaningful life mm -hmm. in front of them. And there are many, many countries, I mean, if you just if you just do the math, I mean, you know, here we have a population of 350 million. It's, you know, it's 40,000 some odd children a year that are born with congenital heart disease. You go to a country like 
China or you go to mm-hmm. India or you know some of these larger countries, the numbers are ast- astronomical, mm-hmm. and so they don't have the ability or they don't have the the manpower or they don't have the education and the expertise. So I mean, this organization, Children's Heartlink, that we've been working with for you know for a couple of decades now, but it's been in existence. Mm-hmm. Just had its 50 year anniversary this wow. year. Um, you know, they uh, have a very organized, structured approach to help develop programs that have a future where they go on to be a training program. And, you know, we generally travel in teams, it's sort of an educational mantra, you know, teach a man to fish so he can feed his family for a lifetime as opposed to just giving him the fish. Mm-hmm. And I have found it very professionally gratifying because you're usually working with your own team members and, you know, it builds camaraderie. You learn how to work with less resources. And there's actually, I always say that I, I feel like I get much more than I give when I go on these trips mm-hmm. because yeah. you learn a lot from these, mm-hmm. from these people, many of, mm-hmm. many of whom are very well trained. And they've learned to deal with such less access, whether it's to your facilities or to personnel or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's amazing how well they function. And it's a lesson for us. I mean, we are more or less spoiled here where we are. I mean, we have everything at a fingertip, mm-hmm. you know, whatever we want, whenever we want it, you know, state of the art and everything. And it's nice to learn, particularly when we're in a, you know, the healthcare industry is such a costly industry. I mean, learning how to work with less is very, I think, helpful mm-hmm. to bring back home. And I, I don't know, David, I'm sure you probably learned that. that yeah, no, more. and I know we're short on time, but it's, uh, yeah, very gratifying. And it's great to have such a great organization here at home, Children's mm-hmm. Heartlink. And it really is actually leads the, leads the world in that space. It's a really great great organization and and we're lucky to have been a part of that well thank you for your work with that and thank you for all you've done to advance congenital heart disease surgery in children i think it's you know you guys have both made major contributions to the field and thank you thanks so much for having us thanks for thanks for having the show it's it's a common thing and i think uh, hopefully this Mm -hmm. is helpful to you know many many moms and dads and other you know parents or family Mm -hmm. members that are struggling or dealing with this absolutely Thank you everyone who watched. You can catch the next Ask the Mayo Mom video question and answer session on February 20th at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. We will be discussing screens and what we know about the effects on children and teens, including both positive and negative aspects. Joining us for this discussion will be Dr. Nushina Minadine, who is the chair of the Council on Communications and Media at the American Academy of Pediatrics. It'll be a great discussion, so be sure to check it out. Thank you everyone and have a great day.